All right, I guess I'm taking over. I'm Tom Morrow. I'm a member of the Dayton Railway Historical Society as well as the Oakwood Historical Society. The presentation format here is a combination of the Far Hill Speaker Series, or they call it, we call it the Far Hill Speaker Series. And it's a combination of both the Wright Library here in Oakwood, Ohio, and the Historical Society getting together to bring in uh, speakers. Now, all of you should be seeing a streetcar, Oakwood number 402 on your screen. If you are not, please get on chat and let Brian know. And if we have to do something to try to fix that, we'll try and do so. All right. Anyway, I, I want to thank you here. I want to thank you for coming. I'm going to slide ahead one slide, hopefully, if the computer will let me. There we go. So the reason that we're here today is 125 years ago, the Oakwood Street Railway converted from horse cars to electric streetcars. And that occurred, their conversion occurred on May 16th of 1895. And the Oakwood Street Railway was the primary public transportation choice in Oakwood. It started ops in 1871 as a horse car and ended as a trolley bus in 1956. It was also served by an inner urban from 1895 to 1941. I'm gonna just talk about very uh, a very brief discussion of why do we build street and other railroads? And then talk about in specific what, what happened in Oakwood. I'm gonna provide some thanks up front to Harvey Hilton. Dave Orsey is on the line here. Thanks for coming, Dave. As well as the Historical Society, the Dayton Public Library, the late Cliff Skulls, the late Ed O'Mara, Martin Kelly, who's still around, and a gentleman I've never met. He wrote a thesis, his name is James Howell. He wrote a thesis in 1962 that delineated a lot of the history, the early history of the Dayton system. Dayton's rail history is extraordinarily complicated. Well, I have a slide to talk about that later on. And then last but, but far from the least is the late Don Brabson. Don spent a lot of time at a library going through old newspapers 20 years ago. The problem was he wrote everything down in longhand. Fortunately, we have all that. If I'd known him better earlier, I would have given him a whole big bag full of dimes so he could have made photocopies. Anyway, so definitions, horse car, street car, light rail, and interurban. This here is a horse car. This is an Oakwood Street Railway horse car drawing from the 1875 Montgomery County Atlas. It is on Oakwood Avenue. It is looking at 622 Oakwood Avenue. And a horse car is a car on rails pulled by a horse. Generally, they were gone by 1900 and they were generally replaced by the electric streetcar, all right? Streetcar. Here's a, a, uh, one of the newer Cincinnati streetcars before they got the wrap for um, AT&T. But this is a streetcar there. It's an electric rail vehicle, usually smaller and slower than a light rail vehicle and usually running in the street. Although there are no strict measures of does that always, is that always the truth or not? And then to give you an idea of scale, you have here, now hopefully you guys can see my arrow moving back and forth. This arrow that I'm pointing at here, this is what we would call a light rail vehicle. You can see it's much bigger than this streetcar, which is here. And they're both bigger than a bus. And light rail is, is of course, larger, as I note on there. It runs faster and for a longer distance, often in private right away. Now here's an interurban car. This is an interurban outside national cash register. It's an Ohio electric car. We'll talk about them later on in the presentation. But they are much larger than a streetcar. They run a lot faster and for much longer distances. They've mostly gone away in the United States and they were mostly gone by about 19, the late 40s, early 1950s. The last one that's left is the South Shore in running between South Bend, Indiana and Chicago. All right, so why do we build street and other railroads? Well, this is if we're di dialing ourselves back to 1870 when, this, when all this started in Dayton. Work and commerce was all downtown your jobs, your shopping, your industry, and your transportation. It's important to note at this point in time, 
the topography of Dayton. And I don't know if uh, Dr. David Schmidt has joined us or not, or was able to, but Dr. Schmidt is the chairman of the geology program at Wright State University. He has a fantastic presentation on the geology of Dayton. And it is really interesting, but the most important takeaway is Dayton's topography is we are a giant saucer. In other words, and the, the bottom of the saucer is right there down where the, the four rivers come together right in downtown Dayton. That becomes a big deal in 1913, but it was true in 1870. It's been true, well, ever since the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, the, the problem being, of course, what's missing? Well, housing. You have to house people. In 1870, Dayton had a population of about 30,000. The homes were dense near downtown. But all we had were muddy streets and no sidewalks. And how could you build a factory on cheap land if you didn't have any workers who could get to work on foot? So we build street railroads specifically to sell houses. That was true back then, and it is true today. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Dayton's first horse car line was the Dayton Street Railroad Company, chartered in 1869 and started operation in May of 1870 on Third Street. The first officers of the company, well, one of them, William P. Huffman, he owned the land on the east side because he wanted to, and he wanted to sell homes on that land. And the vice president was H.S. Williams who owned land west of the river. A marriage made in heaven. They want to sell homes. You can't sell homes unless they're out in the boonies, unless there's a way to get the people who live there downtown. And that's the reason why they sold homes. Now I say also, and well, you take a look at what we're dealing with. This is a city railway streetcar out on Home Avenue, which where this photo is taken is under US 35 right now. And this is out west of Western Avenue. The rhetorical question is who wants to walk or ride a horse in this? So the reason that's the reason why we build street railways. Now, it's still true today. And I, I have three references here for, for Cincinnati, Detroit, and Kansas City all three of which have built streetcars in the last few years. And the main reason that the cities pitched in money to go do it is they wanted to build up the tax base. Why? So they can collect more taxes. To wit, if we step to a photo here of Cincinnati, this is ta a photo taken on Race Street at 15, shortly after the Cincinnati streetcar started. You can see all the, the properties are under construction because people want to live near the streetcar line and the cities want them to because these properties are going to go up in value. You're going to be worth more in, uh, as in the tax base. And it was true in Oakwood. This is from a book called Town of Oakwood. Haas, Mitchell, Dixon, and Harmon, who are our, our city fathers of Oakwood, paid for street curbing, tree removal, and the extension of the horse-drawn streetcar to the corner of Oakwood and Park Avenues. The Oakwood mule car ran every hour, but the problem was after 25 years, there were only a handful of homes in the town of Oakwood. So picture wise, for those, for those who wanna get an idea of what we're talking about in terms of topography, this is of course, as it's noted, the city of Dayton as it was in 1875. You have the rivers coming in here. The bottom of the saucer is right down here. And this is what gets flooded out or starts to get flooded out in 1913, but this is the, the nexus of the city of Dayton. We're gonna be looking at transportation from the top red arrow down to the bottom red arrow. We go past an institution called St. Mary's Institute. Those of you today might know that as the University of Dayton, and you can see there was nothing. That's, this is all urban now, but back then there was nothing between St. Mary's Institute and this little settlement here called Oakwood. And the little yellow line is gonna show you that's where the Oakwood, the Oakwood Street Railway ran from down in Oakwood all the way out to an area they call Dayton View. So in, in the beginning, there were originally two operations. One of them was the Dayton View Street Railroad, Dayton's route number two, starts in 1870. They start building it in May of 1871 and they completed in September of 1871. It goes from downtown out to Salem and Grand on the northwest side of Dayton in Dayton View. 
The Oakwood Street Railroad is chartered a couple months after. It is, uh, their incorporators are Patterson. Well, you might have heard of Patterson. That would be John H. Patterson, the father of NCR. John W. Stoddard was an investor in a bunch of the different Dayton Street Railway lines. Dixon and Mitchell are two of the four founders of Oakwood, and I have no idea who McMahon was. Anyway, of interest is, in April of 1871, the Oakwood Street Railway is reported in the newspaper as being $10,000 short of subscriptions. Subscriptions at the time were, the street railroad went down your street and they said, hey, how would you like a street railroad? And if you would like one, would you pitch in some money for this? So they're short cash to build the line. Well, in May 17th of 1871, there's a report of them meeting with Jonathan Winters. Now, who that might that be? Well, he's not the comedian. I believe he's the comedian's grandfather, maybe great-grandfather. In any rate, at any rate, he is Valentine Winters' dad, Valentine Winters, who goes on to run City Railway. And they also had a small little institution in Dayton called the Winners National Bank. Not surprisingly, six days later, it's reported that Oakwood now has the money to be able to go complete the line and they start ordering rail. They start operations in December of 1871. Now, all this work to construct is going on. Sorry about that. I don't know if somebody's calling me, but I'll stop it. Uh, well, all that discussion was going on about construction, there, was a, there were things going on behind the scenes between the Dayton View Railroad and the Oakwood Street Railroad. And they came up in 18, October of 1871 before Oakwood had even finished with an operating arrangement where they wanted to run their cars together from one end of the line to the other because it makes it more efficient. They don't have to turn around downtown, just better, efficient, more efficient operations. In February of 1872, Dayton View says they're going to Union Station. In March of 1872, Oakwood Street says, we are gonna go one and a third mile south to an area called Oakwood Park. And I underline that because I've been asking for the last, I don't know, 11 years or nine years in the Oakwood Historical Society, where exactly is Oakwood Park? And I can't really get a clear answer. Nevertheless, it's out here and down here somewhere. All right, Dayton View Bill in April 1872, Dayton View builds to Union Station. They start operations in May. While that's going on, Oakwood Street Railway leases the Dayton View Railroad for 10 years on, in June of 1872. And that's when they start the through routing from Salem and River down to Rubicon Creek. They both end up with uh, feeder lines that go at the end of their line that don't necessarily get as much service as the solid blue line. It's reported then that Oakwood, Oakwood opens their feeder line up the hill with three daily runs in June of 1872. And then in July of 1872, the Dayton View line abandons their line to Union Depot. And oddly enough, they leave the tracks in the street for several years because the city can't get, the city can't get them, I guess, to, to pick up the tracks. Anyhow, we start going that the that the um, the information flow starts to go bad. I pulled all that previous information out of newspapers that Don Brabson had unearthed, and we go kind kind of communication silent from 1872 to 1875. I know the Panic of 1873 came along at that time, caused a lot of economic turmoil in the country. When the information starts coming back up in the newspapers, it's February of 1875, and we find out the mortgage has been foreclosed on the line on February 1st, and the combined road is put up for sale, and probably one of those sheriff sales that when the sheriff says we're going to go sell the line, the original guys buy the line back, because if somebody else tries to buy it back, there's going to be problems. I don't know that that's the case, but that's my suspicion. And when you take a look at who was involved, well, there's John Stoddard back again. There's Parrott and Mitchell, two found, four founders of Oakwood. We've got Stephen Patterson, who's part of the Patterson Empire, who's in this. At any rate, and then we also have Isaac Haas. Haas was apparently trying to compete with him, but he didn't have the cash to continue playing along. Now, they noted in the newspaper that the road at the time was not prosperous and run very much out of repair. And of course, the new owners, what do they say? Well, 
we're going to reroute and we're going to improve service. Don't know what happens between 1875 and 1876, but by 1876, a man named Charles Clegg takes over. And the circumstances by which that happens are kind of unclear. Here is a, a drawing or a painting of Charles Clegg from the NCR archive at Dayton History. Charles Clegg will go on to run the, Charles Clegg and his descendants will go on to run this line until 1956. Now, the, one of the first questions that has come up that I had to deal with, with some of my colleagues in the, the historical society is, where did the south end of the line go? There are newspaper, or not newspapers, there are books that, and a map that stipulate that that line went all the way, uh, I guess you could call it, let's just say it's three or four inches below where this little yellow circle is if you went straight down. We saw the drawing before of the horse car in front of 622 Oakwood, which would be about two inches below where this circle is. And as I said, the two books, the two books come back to say, yep, it went down there. It was, it ran all the time. The brutal reality is there just wasn't much out in Oakwood. And there's likely not enough to support a regular mule car, especially with the fact that this is on a hill. Now, I have another piece of evidence here on the left. This is out of Montgomery County uh, Auditor or uh, Assessor's Office, where they, taught, where they show where different pieces of property have been or get split out or turned into plats or turned into subdivisions. This particular one is from 1877. It's when Stephen J. Patterson is starting to plat pieces of his holdings out to his children. The horse car is shown here, coming right down, and it ends at this thing called County Road. Today we know that as West Shantz Avenue, but back then it was County Road. And it doesn't show it going any further. And you may say, well, maybe they just didn't put it on the map. Well, that's the case. They have this little drawing, which would be about an inch below the bottom of the screen where Brown Street comes together with Cincinnati and Lebanon Pike. There is no street railway down here. So I, I point to this as another piece of evidence to say, I know that the, I believe that the car, the cars ran into Oakwood for a time but I don't know how far they, how long they did. At any rate, we dial ourselves ahead to January of 1886. And there's gonna be, there's a theme here. And the theme is the car barn burns to the ground the morning of January 29th of 1886. It was reported they lost six cars and tools. The loss was reported as covered by insurance. The poll quote in the newspaper was, those who witnessed the fire say they've never seen a building of any kind burn so rapidly. Within 15 minutes after the fire was first noticed, the blaze was extinguished and the shed collapsed. Interestingly enough, you know, things moved faster way back when. In less than three months, they open a new car barn at Cemetery in Brown. Cemetery now today is Fairground Avenue. And they, we, I believe they cut back the line to Brown and Stewart, which is right outside the University of Dayton, then St. Mary's Institute. And here we'll take a look at the, their second car barn on New Brown Street. New Brown Street here is what we would call Brown Street. Cemetery Street is now Fairground Avenue. Woodland Avenue here leads to the Woodland Cemetery. Anyway, you can take a look at their operation here right on the corner. Now, what I would, what I would suggest to you is to say, I'm going to give you the number 31. 31 is the number of cars that will be, that will come of interest later. And the size of this, it's about a half a city block, right? Just keep that number in mind. And we even have a photo of the horse car guys outside the barn at Brown and Fairground. If you looked at this photo today, you would not see this building here. You'd see a Burger King, all right? You also wouldn't see this building here. And we'll talk about why that, why that is. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is here's one of their, the Oakwood and Dayton View Street Railway cars or horse cars. He's got 10 windows up on top and he's got six windows in the middle of the car. I also want to draw your attention to two individuals on this photo. This guy here with a goatee and this hat sitting down, circled in blue. And this guy with a bowler hat 
who's with a mustache who's standing up and back. You guys see that? All right, we're gonna we're gonna now look at another photo. This photo here is from the northwest or the south the northwest. Now we're gonna look to the southwest. And what I want to show you is, see that guy? Here's your here's your guy sitting down with the the goatee. We also have the guy in the bowler hat who is sitting down. They've sort of switched places. When you take a look at the car, the car is different. For, at this point in time, it's a five window car with five windows on top, which is to say it's really hard to understand what exactly the, the, the uh, roster of the Oakwood Street Railway was. I'm not really sure. Clearly they had two different sets of cars. As for timing of this photo, this is another little bit of fun. I, people don't like the term fake news, but there, there are some, there's some dispute as to when various photos are taken. I've seen this photo be alleged to have been taken anytime from 1886 to 1912. The reality is it's prior to 1894 because there are no electric wires up here and the electric wires don't start getting strung until late 1894. Now it's also of interest here is that building right back there, it's still with us. That's 1141 Brown Street and is across the alley from Five Guys Restaurant. There's of course no Five Guys in the alley over here right now. And here is the building. And I, I, while the facade is a little different, I'll, I'll jump back for a second. You can take a look and see that there are four window openings, a larger door and then another window on the side and then these two sets of bricks that are oriented like this. Well, one, two, three, four. They've put an overhead door in and there's the other door that was on the other side. And then the two courses of bricks are there. They've changed the facade, but it's still the same building. And here's another view of it from up above to kind of give you a sense of, well, just exactly how big is the building. They had the, the street railway had another car barn up in Dayton view at Salem and North Avenue. This photo was taken not when it was a horse car, but when it was a streetcar line. The streetcars came along through this door, through the building, back around the alley, out onto North Avenue, and then they came back down Salem. And here is an Oakwood Street Railway horse car westbound on Monument Avenue in Dayton. This is Main Street back here. Dayton Fire Station 4 back then and still today is right here at the corner of Monument and Main. And the monument is where God intended the monument to go, right square at the middle of Monument and Main. Subsequently, it got moved away and then it was brought back and put up over here on Main Street but this is where God intended that monument to go. All right, so turning ho from horse cars to street cars, electrification in Dayton starts with the white line, which runs from Maine and Forest out to Eaton and King, which is today McCall and Western, or actually McCall and uh, McGee. And that starts in 1888. There was a small feeder line called the Soldier's Home Ra Railroad that had, was a feeder from the horse cars and the white line electric cars came, and that came along in 1890. Third and Fifth Street convert to electricity in fall of 1894, and Oakwood Street is the fifth in town to electrify in May, of eight, May 16th of 1895. The routing of the line goes from the north end at Salem and North Avenue, where we showed you the, the picture of the car barn that replaced a turntable, all the way to the south end to an area we here in Oakwood call Five Points. And it's one of those things that if you look at it today, you say, there are not five points there, there are six points. It's because they had another street later, but back then it was five points. So I believe the horse cars to that area were abandoned prior to the late uh, 1870s due to low ridership. Charles Clegg had an interview in, 18, in uh, September of 1894, where he said, I'm extending the line south. There's also an 1891 franchise between the Oakwood Street Railway and Dayton that will rear its ugly head in a few charts. But the franchise also indicated that the line was going to be extended. At any rate, they install a loop at five points and the cars turn around in the middle of the intersection. And after electrification, there's four miles of double track, eight miles total. Here's their all-time streetcar roster. You'll see there are 41 cars on this roster. 
They start building cars in 1895. The last cars get built in 1918. A lot of them were built by Barney and Smith here in Dayton. A couple sets of them were built by the Oakwood Street Railway. 395 is an odd ball, an odd duck. 395 has been alleged to be a New York elevated railway car. And there's no way in God's green earth that that car was a New York elevated car. It can't be. It was also, it's been alleged that it was an, a, a, a car that was lengthened in 1907 that used to run on the Pic Troy Railway, also known as the Miami Valley Railway. That's probably more likely, and you'll see why in a moment when we talk about relationships. At any rate, this is their all-time streetcar roster. They sent some of their cars also to, pick, to the Piqua Street Railway in 1906, 1907. We'll talk about that also. Here are your first electric streetcars in Dayton on the White Line Electric Street Railway. This photo is taken out on Washington Street near Germantown. The original streetcar car barn at Brown and Fairground is a lot like the horse car barn. In fact, it's the exact same place. You can also see they say car stable storage, right? And then you also have the building that we looked at that was 1141 Brown Street. That was the powerhouse for the Oakwood Street Railway. Now, one of the things I've never been able to understand, and I've been looking at this for quite some time, is answering this question. This facility is about a mile or a mile and a half away from the nearest railroad line at that point in time. And I have no idea how they got coal to run the powerhouse. Never had a real clear explanation of just exactly how that worked. Because they would have required a lot of coal to run this uh, boiler and then engine and dynamo set. And this is taken from inside their facility on Brown Street. We also have the overhead line crew in 1895. Two guys, a horse, a wagon, and a ladder. That's all you need, and that's all they had. They also had uh, their original cars were single truck cars from Barney and Smith. They came in two styles. You have your winter model with windows, and you have your summer model with no windows. You have nice little curtains that you can pull down in case it starts to rain. Now, what is also of interest is the Spartan interior, wood, comfortable wood slat seats. So you're not gonna wanna try to ride this for very long, but that's what they had and that's what they used. And then here's another shot of 120 out at five points. And this is also a fine, a fine slide because it shows the early, early involvement of Photoshopping. This is a Photoshopped photo and what's Photoshopped in the photo is all the lettering. And they photoshopped the lettering because this photo originally went into a display that was in an industry uh, meeting in 1916. Now, of course, just like we know with looking at memes on the internet now, no meme is correct unless there's a typographical error. There's a typographical error on this one. And that is, they've lettered this as Oakwood Railway Company. Now there was an Oakwood Railroad but there's no Oakwood Railway Company. There's an Oakwood Street Railway, but there's not an Oakwood Railway Company. So anyway, the early, early example of Photoshopping. And here we are in the original repair shop at Brown and Fairground. Now you can of course tell you have supervision here. He's sitting down and he's in a tie. And then all the guys that are working are standing up going and doing something. And here we are in downtown Dayton. We're looking at the Conover building. The Conover building today houses the RTA's main headquarters. The CEO of the RTA has an office, I believe, right here. So he can take, uh, he can observe everything that is going on transportation wise in downtown Dayton. And so it was true back then. We'll talk about that in a minute. When we zoom in a little bit, you can see what's going on here. We've got an Oakwood Street Railway car coming south on Main Street. We've got a bunch of guys that are digging up the Grand Union at 3rd and Main for doing some track work. And we also have an Ohio electric car, one of their suburban cars, number 10, who is sitting here at Main and 3rd waiting to go back southbound. 
Here's another Sharpie shot. That first, that one previous was a Sharpie shot. Here's another Sharpie shot. Zoomed in, we're looking the other direction. That previous one looked to the southeast. This one looks northwest. The courthouse, this courthouse still remains today. This courthouse has been torn down. And you can zoom in and there you see Oakwood Street Railway number 230. What's of interest is that that is a single-ended car, clearly, because if it was double-ended, we'd be seeing a light and, uh, and, the, uh, and also a door to be able to let people get in on the other side. But these are single-ended cars. That's going to change as we move along on the, the history of the Oakwood Street Railway. Here's another Sharpie shot. Now this has got all kinds of interesting stuff in it. The first thing I want to point out to you is that there are three wires that are up here. And you may say to yourself, well, that's no big deal. You know, you go into Dayton right now and there's uh, two wires up for the trolley bus all the time. Well, back in 1904, there, was not, there were multiple different lines that were running on this street, one of which was the Oakwood Street Railway, another of which was the Ohio Electric, and another one was City Railway. Each of the operations had their own wire. There were some places up in Dayton, if you go down by uh, between 4th and 5th, you could see as many of, as five wires in the air because everybody had their own power and you couldn't use somebody else's power. All right, stepping ahead, zoomed in on the cars. We've got a couple of Dayton Street, uh, of Oakwood Street Railway cars here. And we're just coming up to 3rd and Main. What's of interest also in this photo is where the current RTA CEO is sitting off over on this corner. Back in 1904, the Winters, Valentine Winters was sitting here and watching everything that was going on on all these ra uh, street railways here in Dayton. Here's an Oakwood Street Railway car who's heading west on Monument. He's heading out to Salem and North Avenue. He is in about the location that we looked at that previous horse car, but now he's an electric streetcar. This is also Main Street Bridge. I want to say it's either two or three. It would subsequently be replaced in 1904 or 1905 by a bridge that then got replaced in 55 and another one that got replaced in 92 and ad infinitum. Anyway, but when we get into the subject of bridges, here's an Oakwood Street Railway car on a turntable at the Monument Avenue Bridge in 1909. You may say, Monument Avenue Bridge, what's going on? Well, they've installed this temporary turntable because the bridge was under construction. And there's, there's a little bit of a story behind this, and I'm not going to get into a tremendous amount of detail. But suffice it to say, the city of Dayton and Oakwood Street didn't really get along when it came to trying to figure out what was a fair share of building this bridge. Because the city rebuilt all the bridges over the rivers from uh, 1901 or 1902 through about 1910. And one of the, the most uh, contentious matters came up with regard to the street railways and the interurbans as to how much was going to be their fair share of putting up these big brand new bridges. Oakwood Street Railway was fairly cheap. They didn't want to pay their fair share. The city got a little bit angry about it. They ended up at the Ohio Supreme Court regarding the cost sharing of the bridge construction. It's an interesting story that could take another hour, and I'm not going to take it, but suffice it to say, we had to go, they had to go to the Supreme Court to get the problem solved. Now, this is the closest we're ever going to get a color photo of an Oakwood Street Railway car. And it's going over that same, the new Monument Avenue bridge. Unfortunately, the color is not accurate. The color back then was actually dark green with white trim. But you could buy this postcard. You may still be able to buy this postcard. Here's another shot of the Oakwood Street Railway coming southbound on Brown Street at Warren. Those of you who are familiar with Dayton would recognize this as, well, this is where Miami Valley Hospital is. And none of this stuff is here. And you'd be right. The hospital has taken it all down. But you can see the Oakwood Street Railway is coming south on Brown Street because that's how they got from Oakwood to downtown. Here's a shot of 260 out at five points. This is from the Historical Society. I'm not sure what's going on with this guy, why he's got his head tilted that way. 
But nevertheless, we're up, we're at five points at the loop. And as you can see, it's early on because there is just not a lot out here. Now this, I, I have this in a, uh, I have this here to be able to talk about the configuration of the car. When you start look at this car, you'll see that it's got some curves, doesn't have doors necessarily on all the sides of the car. But now all of a sudden you have a car that's got seemingly doors everywhere. Well, this car has been made into a, from a single end car like this one into a double end car. Now, what's interesting is this little apparatus up on top of the car. You'll note that the, it's a double end car, but it doesn't have two trolley poles. Typically what was done with these cars was one pole was put here and it was put on kind of a swivel. That's not what the Oakwood Street Railway did. The Oakwood Street Railway had a little trolley system on top of the car. So the conductor would start here and he would pull the retriever off the back of the car. He'd walk the retriever around and as he walked it around, this thing would slide down and then the conductor would attach the retriever at this end and the car could go the other way. And this car also has been uh, retrofitted with, they closed the car in and it's got folding doors as well. So seminal date, another seminal date. I told you that there was a theme. Well, this is a continuation of the theme. Five in the morning on February 3rd, 1912, the Oakwood Street Railway car barn burns to the ground. And here's the newspaper from the afternoon, the Afternoon Herald. You can see a little bit zoomed in. That's their picture that was on the front page of the Herald. That whole building that we looked at with the guys that were sitting out in front of it right here, it's gone. Now, as the story goes, after the fire, in about a year, a brand new car barn is completed from scratch and ready for operation. It's considered to be an amazing feat of design and construction, talked about in the trade papers. But you have to look at the newspaper articles on the day of the fire. I'm going to read this I, I, it, because it's, it's, I, find, I find it to be tremendously interesting. According to President Clegg and General Manager Gebhardt, it is not probable the present plant will be rebuilt. Instead, it is suggested that a new plant housing both power plant and barns will be constructed further south on Brown Street. Emphasis, where the company recently acquired property. The work of getting things in shape again will be started immediately, according to President Clegg. Next quote, the fact that half a hundred motormen and conductors were in the building at the time the fire was discovered kept the loss from reaching a larger figure. Now, I told you before to keep that number 31 in mind. The newspaper article says 31 cars are run out of the blazing shed in less than five minutes. I do not know how they got 31 cars into that building. That's what was in the newspaper. Take it for what, take it for what it's worth. Three cars were lost in the fire. They were in the repair shot with their motor motors unconnected. Offices of the company were completely gutted, but it was stated that all the important books and papers had been preserved. How very fortunate the land of the, for the new barn was purchased before the fire, and fortunate that the insurance man indicated the loss was fully covered. And here is that car barn they end up building. Those of you familiar with Dayton might recognize this as the former Ray Bryant Chevrolet, and after that, the Frank Z Chevrolet. Well, before both those entities, it was the Oakwood Street Railway car barn. Today, what you would see here is housing for the University of Dayton, which is back out over here. All right, Brian, I don't know if you want to take a break now or we want to, you want me to continue. Uh, hold on. So I've only have one question so far. Um, okay. This is, comes from Nancy Chapala. Um, she lives on Harbin Boulevard and someone once told her that before the high school was built, the trolley cars came down Harmon Boulevard and turned around in what is now the 400 block of Harmon Boulevard between Delane and Acorn. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. We'll, okay. we'll get into that part of the presentation. So Nancy, hold on. All right. All right, any other questions? All right. Um, Ian says, is there any indication of the ridership and how many per day? Uh, you know, let me, I'm gonna take a note to, do, to look that up. I've got a hidden chart that talks about ridership. 
and I, I, I don't want to run around trying to look for it, but I'll pull that chart up at the end and let and show you where Oakwood Street fit in in the grand scheme of things. Okay. That looks like it for now. Okay, and I'm gonna step ahead. All right, let's see if I can get this thing working. All right, as I mentioned earlier, the primary reason we build streetcar lines is to sell houses. And it absolutely was true for the Oakwood Street Railway. I have a, a couple quotes here from Street Railway Journal of April of 1915. Let's set the background a little bit. A gigantic seminal event in this community happens in March of 1913, when at the bottom of the saucer, all the rivers in the world with all the water in the world come down to the bottom of the saucer and they can't escape. The water backs up, downtown Dayton is under 14 feet of water. That's a seminal moment. Those people who live down at the bottom of the saucer looked at that and said, you know what, this is not where we want to live. We want to move out. Along with that, the, the various different realty companies and developers tried to jump on the bandwagon. And there were two guys, Spate Wright, who in some ways are the father of getting, getting Oakwood developed up the hill in Oakwood. They lay out a, a development that they call Park Hill. And I'm gonna step ahead and go backwards for a second. They lay Park Hill out in 1913. Now, to orient you, this is downtown Dayton back up here. This is NCR here. This would be the University of Dayton, or, and, or then St. Mary's Institute. Main Street comes along here, and this is Main, now Far Hills Avenue, and Brown Street comes along here. Park Hill is at the top of the hill where Patterson and Far Hills Avenue come together. Spate Wright lay this out and they figure, we are going to make a mint. We'll see why in a minute, but we're gonna make a mint because we're up on top of the hill. And from 1913 to 1914, it's a fizzle. They can hardly sell anything out here. And the reason for that is Far Hills Avenue is a podunk little path up a, a ferocious hill that's not gonna be real easy to get up and down. So I tell you that to go back to April of 1915. We have part, part of one of the owners in the Oakwood Street Railway passes away. Charles Clegg scoops up his capital stock and now he's got all the capital stock. Spate Wright at the same time marches into the Oakwood Village Council and says, hey, can we get a franchise to lay a street railway from the Loop all the way along Lebanon Road to Peach Orchard Road, a distance of one and a half miles. Those are not accurate. So the numbers are not accurate, but that's what they go in and they get, they ask for, they get approved to do it. And it's funny how things work because it's then reported two weeks later, construction has begun in the company's extension. The line will begin at the junction of Brown Street and Main Street in Oakwood, which is not true. That is actually Oakwood Avenue in Far Hills. And extend over Oakwood Hill and southward through Oakwood, following the Lebanon Pike as far as Peach Tree Road. Now, those of us here in Oakwood would look at that and go, Peachtree Road, where the heck is that? Well, this is a little bit of a kind of inside of inside of inside baseball. John Patterson lived in Oakwood. He is, you know, one of the, if you will, one of the patrons of Oakwood. He's the reason why Oakwood became a village in 1908. That's another long story that's worth telling. But he had a lot of interaction with the Olmsted Brothers landscape architect very famous. For whatever reason, the Olmsted brothers always referred to what we call, accurately, Peach Orchard Road as Peach Tree Road. And this here, here it shows up in an industry newspaper, and it's taken as gospel. But, and I don't understand exactly how that came about, but that's where Peach Tree Road comes from. Anyway, show you the picture of Park Hill. This was a little card that was for sale on eBay. I didn't buy it, but I did grab the image. We have then, we talked about what happened in May. They start constructing. This is June 1915 in the Dayton Sunday News. And I show this nice collection of ads. 
Park Hill, Park Hill, Park Hill, Park Hill. Everybody wants to live in Park Hill. Interestingly enough, every one of the ads mentions the new streetcar extension being built. Now to wit, we're gonna look at this ad in a little bit more depth. This is the bottom photo in that ad. We are standing in Far Hills Avenue, then known as Lebanon Pike, with the northbound track that has already been built. And we're at a street called Camden Place. And you go, Camden Place, where the heck is that? Well, Camden Place is now East Dixon Avenue. Now I am sitting about an inch into off the right-hand side of this photo as we sit today. Um, this is 7 Camden Place, today 7 East Dixon. It's one of the model homes for Park Hill, still exists today. But you can see they put a picture in here to tell, to show everybody, hey, look, they're building the street railway. This is going to happen. We walk about, I don't know, let's call it a 10-minute walk or a five-minute walk northbound down this hill. And we are standing on the hill and we are looking at the loop of the Oakwood Street Railway. And of course, they took the photo to make sure everybody can see there's a streetcar there and the northbound tracks are coming down. Um, interestingly, in another article in that exact same newspaper in a completely different place, the photographer turned 180 degrees and he took this photo. And this was under the byline, not as an advertisement, but as news that Street railway line penetrating Oakwood to be finished August 1st. Here is your northbound track coming down the hill. And he literally turned around 180 degrees to take this photo. Now, interestingly, in the copy, it says the ties of the track are of steel, and they have been embedded in the concrete so as to form a solid and most secure foundation for the rails. Well, in February of 1999, the water main broke at Far Hills and Wisteria. And I couldn't understand exactly why they didn't just get down in and start fixing it because they had pulled, the rail had been pulled out as a WPA project in 1936, but they weren't getting those ties out. And the city of Oakwood's water department found out about those ties in February of 1999. And, the, and Far Hills Avenue was torn up for a good portion of the spring of 1999. Anyway, here's what, another one of those ads. All right, there are dog whistles in this ad. The dog whistle here is 275 feet higher than 3rd Main. In other words, you are every bit of about uh, 263 feet above wherever the water is going to be at 3rd and Main. And then city streetcar service by August 1st. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Here's another ad later on for Park Hill. This is across the street from my house. Seven, this is seven. East Dixon, 15 East Dixon, and 31 East Dixon. And you can see there's pretty much nothing else out here. There's, you know, this was a this was just a farm, farm field. Um, these are the model homes. They are built of brick. They're not the only brick homes, but they are one of a very few brick homes that are in this development because they're the they're the models. Now, what's of interest, of course, is they they cut the picture to be able to make sure you see there's a rail in Far Hills Avenue and there's rails back here. You, you're going to be able to get downtown with a reliable four-minute Oakwood car or board a car for the city to get downtown because that was a big deal to be able to go sell these homes up here in Park Hill. In January 1916, the extension opens. Um, the extension's a feeder line from Five Points to Four Boulevard. Now, the question came up, did the streetcar ever go down Harmon Avenue? No, the streetcar never went down Harmon Avenue. It went straight down Far Hills Avenue and it stopped at Forer Boulevard in 1916. They start through service in March of 1916. Now, I alluded to the, the changes that were made in the car. The street railway had to modify the cars to make this happen because there was no loop at Forer. They just swapped ends of the car. They converted the 28 single-end cars they had at the time to double-end in 1915, and they double-ended their bigger cars, their two-truck cars, in 1915-16. They also purchased land for a loop at Aberdeen right on the part of the property where the library is, but they never built there because, there's a good reason for that, Spate and Wright 
had been selling homes like hotcakes in Park Hill. So they started developing more plats going further south. They developed another 509 plats south of the 1916 end of the line at Fuller Boulevard. And so they extended the line in spring of 1918. And there was a very famous mishap that came about because of the, that line extension. Hey, Tom. Overnight between, is there a question? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I've got yeah. a question here that might be appropriate. Yeah. Um, question is, did uh, the streetcar, the, the, the Oakwood um, Street Railway own any of the land and were they able to profit from the building? Of no, they, they did not. The, it, the, the legal maneuvers that took place were Spade and Wright were the guys who started what's, what they called the Oakwood Railroad Company, which was considered to be a wholly owned subsidiary of the Oakwood Street Railway. And I'm not exactly sure why legally they did that. But the Oakwood Street Railway operated the line, but they didn't own any of the property, at least that we know of. But okay. the Spate and Wright were working with various other developers who owned chunks of land that, well, that were appropriate now to be, because there was a street railway available, they were appropriate to be sold because transportation would be made available. All right. Okay. So overnight between the May 13th and May 14th, 1918, a Dayton and Troy express car and two Dayton and Troy flat cars were, were borrowed and were being used to bring rails to the top of the hill for the Oakwood Street Railway extension project. We're going to talk about oh, Dayton and Troy interurban cars. Where does that come from? Where does that enter into this? The work crews here, and this is the middle of the night, have been working in order to not affect daytime service on the line. At approximately 3 a.m. on the fourth trip up the hill, the connecting drawbar between the motor and the flat cars broke. The cars are on the southbound track, and this was at the north intersection with Harmon Avenue. We saw in the ad previously that Park Hill's at 275 feet above 3rd and Main. Harmon Avenue is at about 250. So he's almost up the hill and the, the drawbar breaks. Well, these cars are full of heavy rail and off they go. They go zooming past Patrolman Castle at Brown in Wyoming, who he calls police headquarters. Sergeant Gundish is on duty at Brown and Fifth. His quote was, I heard the roar when the cars were five blocks away, and what he witnessed was this, that the Dayton Daily News were in the middle of World War I. Dayton Daily News quipped and captioned this as when flat cars invaded the East Fifth Business District. And you can see, this is the turmoil that took place. The cars went right into this building. They were coming down Brown Street, started to take the curve and went in here. There's also discussion that somehow the cars might have bounced off this pole. I don't think that that's, that could possibly be the case because with as heavy as they were and as fast as they were going, they would have got, they would have gone right through the pole. At any rate, we digress. Here's another shot of the damage that was done. And this was extensive. I mean, this is a, obviously a big deal. All right. So in the aftermath, John Waddell, who was on duty at the Cadillac lunchroom, ended up stuck in the wreckage for over a half an hour. He got sent to Miami Valley with a bad head injury and a very poor prognosis. They said in the newspaper, they didn't think he was going to live. He came out of the hospital, thankfully, nine days later. Did $40,000 of damage, destroyed five businesses. But there was a, a great sigh of relief because had the cars been on the northbound track, the, north, the loss of life would have been a lot greater because they would have run smack here into Dayton Fire Station 1. You can see the one up here. This is Fire Station 1 that had a two-ton brass bell up in the top of it. And the thought was, man, if those cars had gone, had been on the northbound track and gone straight into the, the fire station, the bell would have come down and probably did a lot of damage to all the firemen sleeping in there. So after the line gets extended in Oakwood, this is five points. It comes, we come down Far Hills Avenue past Patterson. This is the Park Hill that we talked about before. And you can see now a bunch of other streets have been put in. These are all streets that have been platted and that Spate and Wright have been, they've been selling property down here. The line ends up coming down to Monterey and it loops at Monterey, between Monterey and Hadley. 
if you were on Far Hills Avenue today and you look down there, the buildings that are there look like they're about 30 or 40 years newer than everything else. Well, there's a reason for that because there used to be a streetcar loop there at Hadley and Monterey. This will give you another better idea of the lay of the land. We are at, this is, we talked about Four Boulevard. This is Four Boulevard right here. This is Oakwood High School. My house is, I want to say it should be this one or maybe that one. But at any rate, this is the, this is the lay of the land here in Oakwood. You can see a lot of stuff has been built up fairly close to Far Hills Avenue. Well, as we go further south, they're starting to develop this area of subdivision. This has been built up and more is being built down here. This here, you would recall today, well, that, those are the southbound lanes of Far Hills Avenue. Well, back then, that was Lebanon Pike. It was a two-way operation here. The Oakwood Street Railway ran down the middle. And then there was a little excess street called Far Hills Avenue that was here. We'll see photos of it coming up. But this was not the same configuration that we live with today in Oakwood. Back then, if you were going straight through, you're going to Lebanon, you stayed right on here. And if you were coming up from Lebanon to Dayton, you went up in the right-hand lane here, two-lane road. Here we are at Four, Four Boulevard and Far Hills. This is interesting because we can see the tracks of the Oakwood Street Railway. This is the what are today the northbound lanes of Far Hills. Back then it was just regular Far Hills Avenue. This is not, it was not originally built as a waiting shelter. If you zoom in really close, it says Park Hill. This was built as a little uh, sales office for Park Hill. And then later on, uh, it became, after the, after the development had pretty much been developed up, the building was left there and it continued as a waiting shelter. It's also interesting to note, at this point in time, you could not get from Lebanon Pike over here to Four Boulevard because there was no crossing for the street railway. Those didn't come till 1926. All right. And here we are inside, we're inside the, the car house at Brown Street. And you can see one of the, an Oakwood Street Railway car here. You can see his little trolley on a little, a, a trolley on a trolley up on top of the car. They've got the pole pushed forward. But there's something interesting in the photo and it's that thing right back there. And that's not an Oakwood car. That's a Dayton and Troy interurban trailer. And you may wonder, what the heck is that thing doing down there? Well, as with life, it's all about the relationships. And it's all, we're gonna look at it, it's all about the relationships, the 1906 version. These are five different operations of street railways and interurbans in Dayton. City Railway, Dayton Troy, Dayton and Western, Oakwood Street, and Dayton Xenia. You can see Valentine Winters shows up in a couple places. We've got Clegg's in a couple, three places. We've got a Fernerding, we've got Winters, we've got all kinds of stuff like that. And you may wonder, what exactly is going on? Well, in February of 1889, Valentine Winters, Jonathan Winters, the guy who gave the Oakwood Street Railway the money in 1871, he marries Helen Clegg, the daughter of C.B. Clegg, brother of Harry Clegg. So you now all of a sudden can see, hey, hey, this is a family operation now. If we dial ourselves ahead to 1924, you see now the Fernandings are also a part of the group. And you can take a look at the leadership of all these operations, and it's a lot of the same guys. They control electric railroads from Richmond, Indiana to Xenia and from Oakwood to Troy. And again, it's about the relationships. I alluded to the fact that the Oakwood Street Railway sent cars to the Miami Valley Railway to operate up in Pickwell. Well, here is one of them rebuilding the Oakwood shops. Well, not surprisingly, the Cleggs own the Oakwood Street Railway. They own the Dayton and Troy. They'll, the, the shop will build whatever, the, I guess, the boss tells them to build. Valentine Winters had the ability to call up the Cleggs and say, you know, I need to have some of my cars rebuilt. And sure enough, you have a city railway single truck car that's been rebuilt in the Oakwood shops. We also have, there was work equipment that the line had. This is their tower wagon from 1915, a nice 1912 Packard with chain drive. They had a snow sweeper. 
one of the responsibilities that the street railways had was to keep the tracks clear. That's one of the reasons why the cities permitted them because the cities wouldn't have to clear the tracks. They'd make the street railway not only clear the tracks, but also water them and then to, uh, to keep them clear. The Oakwood Street Railway had a tool car. This is in about 1915 outside the, uh, the car barn. And this was a car that would come out in case they had to do maintenance on either the rails overhead or a uh, car broke down. Now I told you that the Dayton streetcar history is tortuously complicated. I'm only gonna have two charts to talk about it. But here's a very quick summary from 1869 to 1918. Six separate horse car lines, depending on how you count, consolidated into three electric lines in eight, by 1895. Two more electric transit companies were also started pre-1895 and they end up in two of those three consolidated lines. Three more lines were started as city services of inner urbans. Another line was started in 1909. Several new lines were installed by the existing companies and one went out of business. So the math turns out to be six to three to six to seven to seven to six different streetcar companies that are operating in Dayton. They were separate, at least corporately. We can see how some of them were put together. There were relationships that worked behind the scenes but not all of them were controlled by Valentine Winters and the Clegg family. Here's graphically uh, an Electric Railroaders Association map that laid out the rail and Dayton streets in 1932. I've overlaid who operated which lines here. The yellow lines that you see here are City Railway. The brown line here, Route 5, is the Oakwood Street Railway. Now what's interesting here is, and you, it, it's always fun to look at things like maps, Monterey and Hadley are one block apart, but not per what's on here. So you, you have to sometimes take some of these things with a grain of salt. Anyway, we, we digress. The People's Railway is here on Route 7, Route 8, and Route 9, and they go out to the home, down here to Miami Chapel, and also to the, uh, to the asylum at Wayne and Wilmington. Route 6 is the Dayton Xenia Interurban. This is their city service on Water and Lead Avenue. And then you also, you have last but not least, the Dayton Street Railway, which kind of bisects between the, the Dayton and Xenia and then City Railway and People's Railway on the north end of town. It is tortuously complicated. I can walk you through it sometime, but you really want to know <laughs> to sit through it, I think. Anyway. Here's the loop at Far Hills and Oakwood after they extend the line. This is Far Hills Avenue right here. This is Oakwood Avenue connecting up with Brown Street. And there's what they call a balloon loop here. The loop comes around here and goes down here. The line has been extended, so there's tracks that also go straight. You could turn back here. Patterson's home, the Far Hills, was sitting out over here. And that would, that would form the basis of how five points became six points. But that's another story in and of itself. There's a great reason why you always should join your local historical society. When I joined the Oakwood Historical Society and said, yeah, I'm interested in streetcars, they sent me this picture and they said, we think it's on Far Hills Avenue. And I said, oh, oh I am metaphysically certain it's on Far Hills Avenue because that's my house. It also helped me in looking at my house to know did they build the back of the house? Was the back of the house added on later or was, was it built or originally? And we can see the answer right here. There are now houses and trees and the urban forest all around here. But back when this photo was taken, the only thing out there was my house. I also found this at the base of my living room wall when I was pulling down plaster and lath. I presume it was either the plasterer or the electrician who left his streetcar tickets and they, they got penned up the wall for another 80 or so years. Anyway, moving ahead. Back to downtown Dayton, we're at Main and Fourth. This is either People's Railway 302 or an, or an Ohio Electric Open Car 302 leading an Oakwood Street Railway car. Now there are no less than eight street railway cars in this photo. No one that's listening to this probably has ever seen Dayton this busy. But this is what it looked like at the turn of the century. Here's another shot taken from 5th Street looking north on Main Street. 
You got the Oakwood Street Railway about ready to turn on to Fifth. Routing of the Oakwood Street Railway downtown, they went a lot of different ways in a lot of different years for a lot of different reasons. And I have to be, I will confess, I've never fully kept track of all of them. In this particular, in this particular photo, we have an Ohio electric car turning right on 4th Street. He's going to his station at 4th and Kenton. We got a city railway car coming up here. I'm not sure what line he's on. Probably uh, either Hoover or Lexington. And he's turning back. And then there's way in the back, there's a little Dayton Street railway car coming south on Main as well. Here's a little bit later on. We're now in the 1930s. By this point in time, um, we now have mostly cars here instead of horse and buggies. We have two Oakwood Street Railway cars, one going north, one going south. We got a Cincinnati and Lake Erie. I'm not sure if it's a Red Devil or it's a, a 100 series who is turning from third to go south on Main Street. He's going to head for somewhere point south, whether it's Hamilton, Middletown, or all the way to Cincinnati. We also got a city railway car who's waiting for the CLNE to get to clear the, the Grand Union at 3rd and Main. And then we've got a People's Railway car going out on North Main that's behind the Oakwood Street Railway car there. Here's another shot, <coughs> excuse me, on Brown Street of 240. He's coming northbound in front of the car house. Now you'll note that this car is now light in color. And the reason that it's light in color is that there was a an accident that occurred between the Dayton Fire Department and the, and the dark green Oakwood Street Railway cars in the 1920s. And as a result of that accident where the fire engine couldn't see the streetcar, the Oakwood Street Railway was persuaded to repaint their colors into silver. I want to say that they were either silver and with green trim or silver with red trim. But that's why the car looks a lot lighter than the previous ones you might have seen. Here we are out on Far Hills Avenue. That gives you kind of an idea of the lay of the land. This is what's today the northbound lanes. It was a kind of a side street back then. And the main road is across over here. And you can, and this is after 1926 because they've actually got crossings for the Oak, crossings across the Oakwood Street Railway installed. And here is the loop that I talked about at Monterey. This house at Hadley and Far Hills still sits today. You can see interesting things here. We got cars parked on Far Hills Avenue. You go, well, that's weird. Well, back then it was just an access street. So you could park a car on it because the main traffic was going to be over here on what's today the Southbound Boulevard. Here's another shot of a car in the loop at Monterey that sort of tells the Oakwood story. Now, if you look in the background, you see nothing. Well, if I move ahead, not very much later after that, the houses in the south end start popping up. And this is an example of these two houses have been built. I don't know, I don't know when either of these two photos were taken, but obviously they, the one, one predates the other. Here's 402 down back at, near the car house. It's loading passengers for NCR. NCR did a lot of business with the Oakwood Street Railway. Now, even with the relationship that John Patterson had with starting the horse car line, by the time the 19 aughts and the 1910s rolled around, he didn't have a really good relationship and a good opinion of the Oakwood Street Railway at that point. In fact, they didn't get along so well that at one point in 1912, John Patterson wanted to create a competing bus line because he felt he was getting just nothing but crappy service from the Oakwood Street Railway. Here's another shot of one of those same types of cars at Main and Third coming south on Main in downtown Dayton. Now, here's a widely available postcard on eBay. You can go buy this right today. And you can see we're southbound on Brown Street. But you say, well, gee, I'm not sure when or where. Well, let me help you. Let's go back to the original photo. Here's the original photo. Original photo has a lot of interesting things in the photo. First and foremost, you have a railroad crossing here. That puts this where the Dayton, Lebanon, and Cincinnati and the Cincinnati, Lebanon, and Northern, depending on what, when you want to refer to it, crossed the Oakwood Street Railway. Also of interest is there's trolley bus overhead up. So that means that this photo was taken in the last days of the streetcar, late 1935, early 1936. 
You see all the snow and the junk in the street? That'll become important in a minute. Now, we have this nice lady. I think she might have been one of the Romsperts who owns our house, who were the former owners of our house museum in 1947 Far Hills. She's walked out at Far Hills and Wiltshire Boulevard to go ride the Oakwood Street Railway. There you go. This is the same view today, looking in Google Maps, same location. Things have changed a little bit. Now I talked about the sweeper and the tool car. They eventually go to City Railway after Oakwood converts to trolley buses. These are photos of them shortly before they were burned in 1947. Because that's when Dayton got rid of their last streetcars was in 1947. A guy named Noel Hodap, who is an Oakwood resident, purchased several of the disused Oakwood Street Railway streetcars. This is 240 out at a facility that he owned that they called the Argonne Forest. It was, it was set up in order to honor some of the soldiers from World War I and their experience. This was set up as a park. And he had two of these single truck cars and I think three or four of the big double truck cars. One of them was used as an amusement stand. The others were used as cars that you could rent, kind of as, uh, for lack of a better term, a, uh, a cottage that you could rent and stay overnight in. Here's another couple views of two of the bigger cars that ended up out at Argonne Forest. Eventually, they, the, you know, as, we, as the old saying goes, water always wins and mother nature always wins. The only thing that is remaining of these cars today is the actual steel understructures. And they're out there and there's a little plaque, but the guy who was behind putting this all together was Noel, Noel Hodap. Now, Oakwood Street Railway wasn't the only street railway in Oakwood. There were nine interurban lines that came out of Dayton at the peak in 1907. We're going to look at one of them, which is the line that goes down here, because that actually ran in Oakwood. The Dayton Traction was the original name of the line and was chartered in 1895. They got a franchise to run down Main Street to Calvary Cemetery. They followed the south side of the canal. They came out on Traction Avenue. Some of you who may remember Neil's Heritage House, the building still stands. They went, it went right past what's gonna become Neil's Heritage House. Their interurban right of way eventually becomes what's today's northbound South Dixie Drive. Talk about that in a minute. They start operations in October of 1895. A lot of people report it as June of 1896 or July of 1896. That is absolutely not true. These guys start operating in October of 1895. Now they go to Miamisburg in 1980, 1896. And this eventually then connects the line to Hamilton, the Hamilton and Lindenwald line near Cincinnati, making a line that goes all the way from nearly Cincinnati all the way to Dayton. It becomes part of the Ohio Electric in 1906, which gets us connections to Springfield, Toledo, and Detroit, as well as a connection to Columbus. The line is known by a lot of different names over the years. The Hills and Dales Railway, Cincinnati Dayton Traction, Southern Ohio, Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton, Cincinnati, Lake Erie, and finally Dayton Suburban. Harvey Hilton map of the Dayton Suburban Railway starts downtown, comes on private right away, and then pops out on South Dixie Drive. To give you an idea of the lay of the land here, if you come south on Main Street in Dayton, right before you get to Oakwood, the road takes this kind of left-hand kink of about 10 degrees. Well. That's where the traction line came off Main Street. The traction line runs down along here. You can see it's on the map here, if we were able to zoom in close. The Oakwood boundary is on the canal, so the street, so the interurban is in Oakwood. And here's where the interurban runs. They did a lot of business hauling passengers to both to the south and to the north from NCR. There are some of their original suburban cars at NCR. Hauling, hauling people at shift change. They bought some suburban cars and, and quite frankly, they were not beauty contest winners, as you can see. Here is one of their, the latest cars and the, the last cars that they had running coming off Main down to the private right of way. Main Street comes down and goes down off over here and the interurban is gonna come off into the bushes. 
If the cameraman turns around, this is the view that he gets. We are looking today, this is what's called Sugar Camp. If you look here today, there's a bunch of houses that have been built, but back when the photo was taken, the remains of the canal were still here. And then the interurban railway ran right up next to the hill. And here's a little bit further down the interurban railway. This is NCR property. They've already put, they've now put a fence up with barbed wire to keep people out of NCR. But the interurban runs right along here on private right away. Harvey Hilton and Dan Finfrock and I went out one day taking pictures about 10 years ago. And this is before they started building the houses down in this development that's called Point Oakwood. And we still, we found the remains of the steps going up to Sugar Camp from the interurban line. I don't know what happened to those things. They're probably under a ton of, a ton of dirt at this point. If we come a little bit further south, this is the interurban line coming down and crossing Shantz Avenue. Meals Heritage House is right here. This is Shantz Avenue, the main, the main street, if you will, that went between Cincinnati and Dayton. The photographer goes down another, I don't know, maybe half a block down the interurban right away, and we've got this shot. He's looking at, we have the same, same building as here with this turret, same building back here. You can't see so well up the street because the urban forest has grown up. Here's South Dixie. Those of us who are in Dayton will know when you go down South Dixie, you go up and down as you go further south. There's little hills and undulations. When you go on North Dixie, it's flat as a board. That's because they put the northbound North Dixie Lane or South Dixie Lanes in the interurban in the, the uh, interurban right away after the interurban went away. Here we are, Dayton Suburban 203 at the Dorothy Lane Y. I referred to Dr. Schmidt's presentation on the geology of Dayton. There's an area of Dayton that's off to the left of this photo called Moraine. that's named for this geological structure here, which is a terminal moraine. You might recognize this geological structure today as a Walmart. You might also recognize this as the Golden Nugget Pancake House. But back when this photo was taken, this is where the, uh, the, the interurban turned back and was able to go have city service to the south end of town. And then here's Cincinnati Northern 48. He's preparing to return south on Main at 3rd. He's come along here, he's parked in here. He's gonna put his pole up, take this track and run southbound. As I said, Ohio Electric did a lot of business with NCR. Here is shift change at NCR. This is not recommended. When we got this photo, this was the ca it was captioned as it's an Oakwood Street Railway car, but it's not. And we know that for sure. The first thing that I would tell you to look at is look at the way this guy is dressed. Take, keep it in your mind. The second thing is we're going to zoom in on the car a little bit, up in the top of the car. If you look at the top of the car, there's writing. I'm going to superimpose some of the letters that are there. What this says is Hills and Dales, which was where this car went to. So it's not an Oakwood Street Railway car. It's definitely an Ohio Electric Suburban car. Now, I told you to take a look at the conductor in that last photo. Well, that conductor and this conductor got the same haberdasher because he's dressed exactly the same way. And he is clearly on Main Street, not on the Oakwood Street Railway, on the Ohio Electric. This is at the crossing where the Cincinnati, Lebanon, and Northern slash Dayton, Lebanon, and Cincinnati crosses Main Street. And then all good things come to an end. That service stopped in September of 1941. Now, granted, this was not terribly convenient for an Oakwood resident to be able to take unless you lived relatively close. But the positive is when the line was running, you actually could ride all the way to Detroit by just standing out at a street corner in Oak, or a little bit outside of Oakwood. Anyhow, step ahead to trolley buses. Remember I told you that there's a theme about fires? Well, I got another one for you. Five o'clock in the morning on August 24th, 1932, Dayton Street Railway's car barn burns to the ground. They lose most of their cars. They have a real infrastructure problem because nobody's really done a whole heck of a lot of work in 23 years of the line being in existence. They get a deal for newfangled trolley buses. They just got to string an extra wire 
They agree to go do this. And the first trolley buses show up in Ohio in April of 1933. And here is number 100, the first trolley bus in Ohio at Lorraine and Prince. Oakwood Street Railway is in a similar state of disrepair. Their last new cars are 15 plus years old. Their franchise expires in early 1935. They go to the council and say, we want to convert to trolley bus. Oakwood Street Railway, uh, or the city says, well, that's just great because your cars are nothing to write home about because you still got some 40 year old cars that are running up and down the streets. And they also offer the track up in the boulevard to the city who has a desire to turn that two sets of two lane streets into one four lane boulevard, which is exactly what gets done. So service is expected to start in mid-December. The buses came a little bit late. We saw the photo of 402, snow and cold temperatures delay the start until January 19th, 1936. The line, it goes six blocks south to the new business district at Dell Park. And then in 1950, they extend the trolley bus three more blocks to Dorothy Lane. The story of why it didn't go all the way to Dorothy Lane to begin with is there was a guy who owned a filling station who wasn't willing to sell to the, to the state or the city. As a result, the road went from five lanes to two for one block, and it operated that way for, well, I don't know, 20 years or so. And then the Oakwood operation has been in tax since July 1936 and has seen now five generations of trolley buses. Here's their all-time roster. The only real oddball here is 35. It only was in Oakwood for a couple of weeks. There's only one photo of it that's on the street. I didn't include it, but it was not of the same electrical design as what the Oakwood Street Railway was preferred to have. And so it was shuffled back to the Dayton Xenia relatively quickly. Here is 32 looping at Far Hills in Del Park. This is at the south end of the line. Here's a little promotional video from General Electric. We are standing on top of the Art Institute. This is a 1933 Brill, the Dayton Street Railway was running. The photographer is now gonna go stand here. If you were standing here today, you'd be under the bridge for I-75. The street railway or the, the trolley bus still runs there today as part of the RTA. Here we are at Main and Third. This was a revolutionary thing that you could load passengers at the curb. That was changed in about 1940 because the trolley bus has had a difficult time making this maneuver when the traffic was bad. They put them back in the middle and they ran down the middle and pulled people off these safety islands. Now I show this because we are going to go to Oakwood, strangely enough. And here we are, we're on Brown Street at L Street. You would recognize this as Holy Angels Church. You can see the trolley bus, he gives that car a run for his money in terms of acceleration. We're here at five points. I just am shocked that the trolley bus just comes right down here and doesn't stop. I don't know if they set, set it up for the movie or what. This is in probably the spring or the summertime because there's leaves on the trees and the windows are open on the bus. This is at the South End Loop at uh, Dell Park in the middle of Far Hills Avenue. And this is the South End, what was then the South End Business District of Oakwood, still is today. We just have to thank the photographer here because he carefully made sure to put in exactly where we're at. We're at Far Hills and Monterey Road, and you can see the operation of how Lebanon Pike worked because they even had the trolley buses running there. Because we got a northbound bus and now here comes the southbound bus. Now this street operation would be changed after the summer of 1936. And then another shot at five points. I wanna draw your attention to the interesting traffic operation. Now, I don't know that I'd get that close to a trolley bus coming at me, but that guy coming off Oakwood Avenue clearly did. Anyway, here's another shot at uh, Main and Third, the Grand Union. I got another video here for you that will show you in color from the Earl Clark collection. It's a 12 second short because he only cared about the streetcars. There's an Oakwood Street Railway trolley bus that's following this uh, two car on Fifth Street. We're at Fifth and Jefferson in downtown Dayton. 
so you can kind of get an idea of what the color of the bus was. Sadly enough, they didn't want to take pictures of the trolley buses. They only cared about the streetcars. Now, in Dayton, there were five trolley bus operations eventually. We're going to see four of them here People's Railway, City Railway, Dayton Street Railway, and then Oakwood Street Railway. The guy who's missing is Dayton Xenia Railway. I don't know that I've ever seen a picture of all five together, but I've looked and I, I will continue to watch. Here we are back in Oakwood at Far Hills in Beverly. You can see how kind of narrow the street is. We'll talk about that in a minute. Here we are coming southbound at Five Points. And the photographer has now turned 180 degrees and he's looking up the hill southbound. You can see where they've pulled the tracks out already when this photo was taken. Here we are coming southbound on Far Hills at Monterey. This is late, late in time because you can see, I don't know what kind of car that is, but it looks like 1954 or 55. That looks like about a 53 Ford, 54 Ford. Here we are at downtown at Ludlow and Fifth, July 1955. Now I talked about ties before. Well, in Dayton, the ties stayed in the ground until 2012. Here's a shot of them having been excavated out of Brown Street when Brown Street got rebuilt in 2012. Here's the Oakwood Street Railway and the next Dayton Street Railway trolley bus loading in the safety islands. It used to be when you rode the streetcar and the trolley bus, you had to stand out in the middle of the street and they conveniently put a little raised platform for you and then put up barriers to theoretically keep cars away. They didn't always do as great a job as they could. Shift change in NCR, Oakwood Street Railway is doing some business. We're standing at uh, Holy Angels Church. Dayton, the Oakwood Street Railway also had a, a diesel bus line. The Dayton Suburban bus lines were part of Oakwood Street Railway. They ran a parallel service on Schroyer Road. Here's 155 at Schroyer and East in December of 1953. And then here's a few of their buses outside the car barn. We're still a car barn because you've got overhead wire going into the barn. And this is outside their barn on Brown Street. The end of the Oakwood Street Railway is going to come. February of 55, the city had been hounding the street railways for 60 years. You guys gotta, you guys gotta consolidate. Finally, in February of 55, there's only three left, City Railway, Dayton Zenia, and Oakwood Street Railway. Now note, this would be Valentine Winters, these are the Fernandings, and this is the Cleggs, and they're all, they all are working together. They, want, they need to get a fare hike to go from 10 to 15 cents. The Dayton Mayor Stout's response was, you're not getting a fare hike without a merger. Now he later walks that back four months later, but the message is received. In October 55, City Railway merges with Dayton Zini to form City Transit. They start combined ops in November of 55. City Transit and Oakwood Street continue to work out arrangements, and I'm not sure exactly what is going on. There's a, you know, reading the newspapers, they say it's going to happen in March of 56, and then, then later, and eventually it doesn't happen until October of 56, at which point City Transit buys Oakwood Street Railway and Dayton Suburban. They started operating informally in October and perform major reroutings in November. Schroyer line, so the Schroyer Road line continues to run. Heck, it even runs today as Route 17 for the RTA. Back then, it was extended to town and country at Schroyer and Stroop. They become Route A and B in 56 when City Transit buys the line. In 56, City Transit also realigns many of the lines in Dayton. The Oakwood line is also affected. They string up about a block worth of wire and they tie it in to better balance service on both ends of town with the Salem Avenue line. In May of 1962, they extend the north end of the line about a mile rather than looping this big loop on Catalpa, Hillcrest, and Philadelphia to loop at Stanhope and Hillcrest off Salem Avenue. In January of 67, they extend the south end of the line to Stroop Road from, from Dorothy Lane. And then in December of 67, they extend the north end of the line out to Salem and Fairgreen, which is about another two miles north. And they tie the Hillcrest buses to Dorothy Lane and Fairgreen buses are tried to Stroop and they go back and forth all day long. And then in, October, in August of 1988, the north end of the line is moved from Salem to Valley Street. And this is the end of the Oakwood Street Railway. 
All right, we are at Bolander, the Bolander Avenue Barn of City Railway, or City Transit at that point. This is October 7th of 1956. The Oakwood Street Railway has moved over to Bolander Avenue. You can see one of their Marmon Harrington trolley buses here. There's another, there's more pieces to this story. This is Dayton Trolley Bus 521, which has just come in from Little Rock, Arkansas. This is bus 57. 57 is an ex-Dayton Xenia bus that has been repainted into city, city transit colors. Would run for another four or five years under, as part of city transit. Moving on a little bit further into the 60s, this is a fan trip out on Far Hills Avenue at Aberdeen. They still permitted parking apparently on Far Hills at this point in time, but you can see it's uh, you know a typical summer in Dayton. The grass has already turned yellow. This is a, a shot that is maybe better spent uh, when we have when we're doing this in person. Because this is we're in Oakwood, but where are we in Oakwood? Well. I'll give you this part of the photo. Does it give you an idea? Nah, maybe not so good. I know where we are, but you probably don't. If you see this, you say, ah, oh, obviously I'm up on Far Hills Avenue. I'm, I'm at, just at the top of the hill. I'm right at Far Hills and Patterson Road. Now I say to you, look how wide the street is. There's the bus here. This guy who wants to get around the bus, he's got to go cross over the white line to do it. And there's not two lanes in the southbound side. What's going to happen? They're going to widen the road. And we have a great photo that was taken by Ed O'Meara. Ed took this, and it shows a lot of interesting stuff. Far Hills Avenue at this point in time is two cars wide. We are at Far Hills and Wisteria. My house is right back there. Right over this thing here is my house. So we're, Far Hills Avenue is two cars wide. City Transit has already put in the new line poles that are going to go up for when they widen the street. And so here they are sitting, nice tapered line poles. You still see this old 1915 line pole. If you go down on Oakwood Avenue, go south or north toward Dayton, you'll still see some of these 1915 and 1895 line poles. And then don't believe the sign in the bus because it's not right. All right. This is a little bit further down the hill as we're coming down the Oakwood Hill. We've got poles and lights put in for what are going to be what's going to be the new road that goes over there. This side is going to lose this little bit of space here, and we are going to then now have a four-lane road up and down the hill. Now I captioned this photo. This is a, a cliff skull shot at the right outside the Far Hills Theater. And this is, you ever wonder why OSHA was invented? This is February of 1962. There's a terrible sleet storm going on, and we've got a guy up on top of the bus. He's reaching for the positive wire. That would be a real bad thing to do. Anyway, and then we've got a Bill Volkmer shot here. This is the way Oakwood's downtown used to be laid out, <coughs> where the traffic ran right next to the curb, and the middle was parking. If you go down here today, this is where the transportation, this is where the street is. And there's a small little access street here with angled parking that comes along here. But it was a lot different in May of 1960. Here's a famous shot of City Transit 540, the Christmas bus. The early, this, and this is the first year of the Christmas bus. Bill Owen, who used to run City Transit, allegedly made a call to the Dayton Fire Department shortly before this bus was put on the street. And the words were, if any damn fool calls you up to tell you that there's a trolley bus on fire, don't bother responding. Because he had a chimney with a smudge pot in here. Well, we are, we are shown here in Kettering, fortunately, who didn't get the same call that the Dayton Fire Department got, because the smudge pot caught on fire, set the chimney on fire, and the bus really was on fire. And here are the guys from the Kettering Fire Department putting the bus fire out. And then I got a Dave Orsey shot coming uh, down the hill on Oakwood Avenue. And he's running northbound at Christmas time. This is a different Christmas bus. This is 561. And this was taken in 1969. We have an interesting thing here. This bus is crossing four streets as you look at it. There's a, a quirk of Oakwood and Dayton is this is Brown Street. This is Springhouse Road. 
This is Irving Avenue and this is Oakwood Avenue. So he's actually on four streets right here. Here's another shot at five points. Trolley bus is coming, coming up the hill. If you don't have a trolley bus today, the 14 Centerville bus runs fairly regularly of every hour or so on Far Hills Avenue. And you occasionally get a trolley. This is the first day that 9813 came out. They hadn't had trolleys on the line for a while. I heard that it was happening and I was waiting for it. And sure enough, he shows up and he's got his sign wrong. This is just how it works with Tom. 9850 is down in the business district at Far Hills and Peach Orchard coming southbound. And then this is the newest generation of trolley buses. This is 1402, one of the new trolley buses that the RTA has purchased over the last six years. And he's coming south at Far Hills and Del Park. And with that, I'm done. Now I'll field questions and I'm gonna flip, I'm gonna turn my screen off for a second because I gotta go look up um, the question on the amount of uh, service. So hold on just a second. I don't know, Brian, if you want to uh, let people ask questions or bring up texts or something like that, I'm willing to do it. Okay. Um, so people can use the chat to ask questions or there is a Q&A um, function that you can also use just to type in a question. And then we'll read those and, and give you answers. And I'm looking right now for the chart that I've got hidden because I've got a uh, rider. I think I have the ridership information here. It's always better to show the numbers rather than just talk about the numbers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, is that, yeah, here we go. Do you guys see Oakwood street, streetcar streetcar service summary, 1926? Yes, we do see okay. that. So we're going to walk through, this is out of a study that the different lines in Dayton, or the city of Dayton actually commissioned in 1926 to talk about what is the amount of service. It talks about the different lines that we have in town, how many cars are available, how many do they need at rush hour in the morning, non-rush hour in the morning, non-rush in the afternoon, afternoon rush and night. It also has important things on rides and revenue, all right? Your number one line in town, and I'm sorry that I've got these, uh, the, uh, the annotations are not in the right place, but I know what they are already. Let me, oop, I flipped that off for a second. Sorry about that. Let me go back. Uh, you know what these are already. Okay, so the white line is the king of all lines in Dayton. Hey, Tom, you're not sharing your screen anymore. I'm not sharing. I'm not streaming. Oh, okay. Hold on. Uh, it looks like it is. Zoom, share screen. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, now am I okay? Am I back I up? Don't, I don't have it back. Okay, hold on. Oh, here it is. Got it now. Showed back up. Okay, good. So the white line which is today would be North Main going out Lakeview, is, got, is the king of all riders, 7 million rides a year in 1926. They make $302,000. The second and third behind them is 3rd Street and 5th Street with 6.9 and 6.3 million riders a year. You can do the math, you know, divide that by let's not call it 365 because it wasn't, we didn't have full ridership all those days, but call it like divided by 300. And all of a sudden you see, there's a pretty serious amount of riding every day. Like 20,000 people on each line ride it every day. Um, coming up behind those is, uh, I gotta look at this, it's those guys. We got the two line, two other city railway lines, Fifth Street and Camer. Oakwood Street Railway comes in as the fourth, fourth most uh, ridden line. Now remember, they were hauling a lot of passengers to NCR from downtown because it was the only line that and the Ohio Electric were the only lines that ran between downtown and NCR. So there was a lot of transfers that would come off these lines that would ride the Oakwood Street Railway. So 
don't think of this as, you know, trying to do ballpark math of 15,000 riders a day from Oakwood. Probably most of that ridership was to NCR. But still, they had plenty of cars. You know, we, we look nowadays from service on the RTA, and this is, it has been this way since, the, since 1972. There's only one bus that usually runs up and down the street at night. Back then, they had 12 buses on the line, all right? During the middle of the day, during the afternoon rush, they had 19 cars out on the line. That's a significant amount. You're talking about a car probably every five to six minutes. So the service was tremendous, but again, that was back when a lot of people did not drive. So you have to take it, you you have to, you have to understand what you're looking at. Does that answer yeah. the question, hopefully? Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, so I've got one question from Linda. She's wondering if the Fernandings that you referenced earlier um, as uh, I forget if they're presidents or whatever of one yes. of the railroads, would they be related to Fernandings currently living in Oakland? Yes, they're the, sa they're the same okay. family. Okay. I see one other question. Oh, just comment. Very interesting data about the number of rides from Ann. So. I'm having a hard time actually finding the presentation on the screen. I don't know that I, I have the ability to see any of the chat. Um, do I have to click something to do that? If you hover your mouse at the top, I think your toolbar should come down. Ah, okay. And then you can just click on chat. Oh, okay. But I'm not seeing any other questions at this point. If, if anyone has anything, please feel free to type in your question, either in the chat or the Q&A. All right. Okay. Well, uh, if there's no more questions, uh, let's see, is there, do we have the ability, I know we saw that thing with Bill, Bill Van Doren, that he was able to hold his hand up. Do we have a hold your hand up view on this somewhere, Brian? So that would show up under participants, and I'm not seeing any way, anyone with their hand up right now. Okay. Yeah. But I think I, oh, we've got more hands up now. <laughs> ah, there we go. Uh, we want to unmute Mr. Van Doren. We'll take Did, our uh, was Spate right? Any connection with the uh, Wilbur and Orville? Ah, good question. Not that I know of. Um, it was Ed, the guy's name was Edward O. Wright, and near as I can tell, he had no relationship whatsoever. He was, however, one of the guys, Spate Wright. Not only did they do a lot of planning for the Oakwood Street Railway. If you go before 1913 and after 19, call it 1916 or 1917, they are all over town on the north end and on the south end that are laying out real estate developments because that was what their business was. So it looks all like right. we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, Cynthia, we'd like to know where Oregon Forest Park was. Argon Forest Park is out on Germantown Pike. I can't remember how far out it is, but if you go to Dayton Metro Parks, it's one of the Dayton, Met it was absorbed into Dayton Metro Parks a while back. But it is, it is I don't wanna say it's a hike out of town, but it's not certainly in the city of Dayton. It's, it's outside. Okay. And James is asking, he says, Bob, Alperin once told me that um, Oakwood Street Railway is one single, okay. Can you bring up the quick Q&A? Um, uh, I'll try, let's yeah. see. I'll let you read that out loud. One single, what, Blessinghouse tra Trolley Coach actually went back and forth a few times with City Railway. Well, what happened with that thing was, they, it came in the order, City Railway had, uh, they ordered 45 buses from Pullman. And this bus got tacked on to that order. Now, City Railways buses were GE powered. That, was, that, that other one that I alluded to, 35, which eventually was 
number 62 at Dayton Xenia, that thing was Westinghouse powered. As it turned out, the only guys in town that did Westinghouse power in Dayton were Dayton Xenia. We never understood exactly, you know, how or why that bus ended up over at Oakwood Street Railway. But it did for the day or a week or a couple of weeks. And Oakwood said, we can't maintain this thing. And back it went. It ran at Dayton Xenia until uh, the line was consolidated. Then it was renumbered to 45 and ran in Dayton for city transit as number 45. So I don't know that it went back, if it went back and forth a number of times, I'm not sure that that's the case, but it definitely went back and forth in 1955. Oh, ownership of the coach. I, I don't know. I don't know that, it, you know, with the, create, with the relationships that took place between City Railway and Dayton Xenia, I guess I wouldn't be surprised to find out it was owned by City Railway, but operated by Dayton Xenia. But we never really have gotten a straight story on why did that, that bus come in a configuration nobody could maintain? Does that help, Jim? All right. Okay, great. Well, I don't see any other questions. So, um, Tom, this was fantastic. Uh, a whole lot of information. So, um, thank you so much for doing it. And um, thanks for, to the Historical Society for continuing the collaboration for this. And um, just to let people know, we will have the recording of this um, presentation available. Um, it's going to be on YouTube, our YouTube channel, but we'll also um, embed it in um, our website on the event post in the calendar. So if you want to reference it, it'll be available to come back to. All right. Well, I say, uh, and I also echo Brian, Brian's thanks. Thanks for... Thanks for playing today. And uh, maybe, Brian, sometime we can do this again. Absolutely. We'd, we'd definitely like to do that.